My guest today is Oren Aini. Oren, how are you, sir? I'm doing very well, thank you. Yeah, and uh, I, you are. I already know this. You, 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 and your team have invented a very cool product called Raven DB. You're, you're kind of positioned yourself as the database guy. Yeah. And databases are complex things. I use databases all the time, but I've never attempted to create one. Oh. Um, and you're telling me that one of the recent innovations is you've uh, built a new indexing service. Is that? Am I saying that right? Cool. Um, indexing engine, but yeah. Indexing correct. engine. Okay. Um, cool. Well, first of all, tell me uh, a little history here. What your your product already had an indexing engine. What was yeah, your motivation so for writing your own? I would go back a little bit, if you if I may. Uh, I used to be the the guy who came to uh, to clients and helped them make the database go faster. Okay. And a lot of that was about fixing ignorance or stupidity or <laughs> just outright what were you thinking? Uh, I hope you delivered uh, that in a softer way. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, no. One of, uh, one of the... Here's the problem. One of the things I was literally hired to do was to be that out-of-town guy who would come and tell you this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, which everyone knew it was wrong, but uh, you just had to pay someone a lot of uh, money to So you were the outsider. That, you could come in, be yeah. the bad guy, and say, you, you're Correct, stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and then you left and let them, and then they said, uh, yeah. that guy was yeah. mean, but we'll fix it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that was, a, a, that is somewhat a cavalier way of saying that, but for the most part, you know, a single web page shouldn't generate 2,000 requests to the server, to the, to the database server. That's just, you know, wrong. There's, I have no way of saying that. And the problem was that I wasn't dealing with stupid people. I wasn't dealing sure. with incompetence. Smart, I was dealing smart with people, people make dumb decisions sometimes. Yeah, and I get that because uh, you want to build an application. I want to focus on the application, not on the minutia of how the things work. And... I decided that this is really, really sad, and I want to do something about it. And actually, I didn't decide that. What happened was that I got this idea in my head of I wish things could be better. And then it wouldn't leave me alone. Literally, I woke up at night dreaming about how this is supposed to go. Mm-hmm. And eventually, this became a RevenDB, which was a database, is database, to build business application or TP systems without going crazy. Sure. And in order to do that, we took as much as possible off the shelf. And the indexing engine that we use is Lucene, which is an amazing library that has been around for, I don't know, 25 years or so. Yeah, lots of people use and, Lucene or yeah. some port of it. Yeah, and to the point where Lucene is basically the industry standard for search. Hmm. And we use that, and we use it very effectively for about 15 years. But here's the problem. Lucene is meant to build a search engine, something like Google. Hmm. It is not meant to be an indexing engine for a database. Uh, is, it a, is it the size that's the difference? It's not the size, it's the, uh, call it the semantics. Okay. So let's talk about the, uh, uh, the difference between them. So let's say that you're now building a, a search engine like Google. You would have a crawler, you would go and grab all of the details, and then every hour, every day, you would update your index. Mm. Because updating index is a really, really expensive operation. Uh, so the whole design of Lucene is around those notion of batches, and the notion that a uh, it's okay. I need to be really, really fast to answer queries, and I can put a lot of my cost on initialization or index time, those sort of things. On the other hand, for a database engine, I don't have batches. I have, you know, people doing 100, 100 uh, writes a second, which is really, really small. 
but they expect that those results to be stopping. I made a change, I should see it in the query right away. And with Lucene, that was a huge issue because you can make small changes, but it is really fighting you against that. Yeah. And the design of Lucene is based around batches that uh, are relatively big, and then you merge them. And indexing time can be really, really small until you hit a merge, and suddenly it become ridiculously expensive in the order of, oh, I have a few milliseconds to do a small index, but now I hit a merge, and now it's going to take me 30 seconds to, to do that. Uh, and that, that was the, one of the major issues that we had, but the other one was about the overall architecture and approach that we use. So RevenueB is a, a database written in c .net. For the past decade or so, we have been running on .NET Core, uh, when it was still a DNX. And one of the most interesting things from our perspective is this transition that we went, we went through from being a, a standard .NET application that is exposing some service over the web to being a real engine and paying attention to things like memory utilization, performance, all sorts of things. And it has been really gratifying to see how it happens at the platform side as well. Mm -hmm. The, every time that uh, I went and read the .NET 8 release, uh, release notes recently, and I was basically had to get them up to wipe my drools from all of the, 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 the amazing things that I saw there about, oh, yeah, uh, save instructions on reducing location here and a whole bunch of other stuff like that, that makes my life so much easier uh, in order to be able to deliver the, the relevant performance. Uh, why does it matter? It matters because Lucene as a fundamental level doesn't match the sort of architecture, architecture that we have. For example, uh, it is very focused on reducing size on disk. Remember, it was written in the beginning of 2000. Uh, when the disk and, space was expensive. Yeah. And the sizes that you were working with were very small. So it made sense. I want to pay more cost at at indexing time to reduce my uh, uh, this size because I'm not working with a lot of data, but this is expensive, etc., etc., etc. And this is not the situation today. And that actually leads to problem. Why? Because the Lucene file format is a compressed file format that if you want to access that, you have to go and decode that into right. manage objects. Which that's, means that's that you extra have latency, with... extra computer. Yeah, yeah, and, and and you actually pay for that twice. You pay for that at the query time where you generate all of those. In, you you have to go over and read it and do all of those, and then you pay at the other side when the garbage collection need to collect all of those mem all of those locations. That is an insane cost to pay, especially when we're talking about, I need to, one of my criteria is hitting 1 million requests per second with under 200 millisecond latency on all of those. A million requests per second? Yeah. Wow. Uh, just to give you some context, uh, what I have here, this is a Raspberry Pi Zero. Okay. Okay. It has a... It is quad core one gigahertz arm uh, arm uh, machine, and it has 512 gigabyte. I'm able to achieve uh, greater than 500 queries per second on that with those limitations. This is what we'll talk about when I have a, a, a I have a very a, a strong demands from the kind of performance that I need. And being able to reduce the location by even a little bit adds, you know, two three percent to the uh, overall performance, mm -hmm. and that adds up. So one of the things that uh, uh, we've been been driving us crazy is how to control the performance allocation predictability of Lucene, and we came up with the idea of Corax, and Corax is Voron, is a Corax is Raven in Latin. Uh, oh, I didn't know Voron, 
Korax yeah. is raven in Latin. Okay. Korax. Yeah, uh, and Voron, which is Ostrogen, is a uh, raven in Russian, and uh, it's, it's become a team. Oh, you've got hundreds of languages to choose from for the yeah. next <laughs> part of your product. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I just have to make sure that this is uh, a language where I can pronounce that. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, you, have you used Hebrew yet? Uh, no, no. <laughs> the, the, the Hebrew one is the uh, default username on uh, on the domain. Okay. <laughs> uh, the guest user, basically. Uh, but b- basically, we came up with the idea of Coax as a how I want that to be, how I want to design that. And we started working on Corax in 2014. That's the first time that we actually sat down and wrote code and tried to, to smack it out. And we were never able to actually uh, uh, dedicate the time and resources to implement that. We kept, okay, uh, a few weeks here and there just to, to see how it works. Okay. Did you say 2014, and, 10 years ago? That's when you started yes. this project? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, Lucene is the industry standard for a reason. It is really, really good. And because of that, we had a huge issue. It was obvious that this is going to be a big project. Yeah, you In don't order want to lose it, features and yeah. replace it with something brand new. Mm, yeah. So that's one problem. The other problem, I needed to be, in order for me to pay off and take the risk of changing the indexing engine and everything associated with that, it has to pay off. So our criteria was 10 times faster than Lucene for indexing and querying wow. on all common scenarios. Yeah. So, and it's funny because this is a really ambitious statement. Yeah. But it tells, uh, but it tells out that uh, you can do that by choosing different trade-offs. So one of the things that we have done, I mentioned earlier that the batch-oriented nature of Lucene is super problematic for us. So we we were working on a a, a model where we can build the data in an incremental fashion, so adding one, two documents at a time doesn't incur this sort of debt that I have to pay down the line, which is what happened with the batch of the design. Uh, so globally, uh, how does how does the scene work? We've seen take a bunch of documents, they call it a segment, and turn that into a file. The file includes all of the documents, the relevant search terms, etc. So far, so good, and this is awesome. Now, the next time that you have to index, it creates another segment, another segment, another segment. Eventually, it needs to merge all of those into a bigger segment. I won't go into how it handles update or deletions because, honestly, that's crazy. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really complicated... It's uh, all, to uh, me, it's all complicated. I've never even attempted uh, to create it's, an indexer. You know what? <laughs> I, I, I'm going to show you something because I, I, I think that, uh, to a large extent... This sounds super, super scary, and it's not. Uh, What I would like to show you is one slide, and you should be able to see it now. Do you see my screen? Yes, I do. Okay. What you see here is an index signature. In one slide. It looks very simple. Yeah. So just to give some context, here we have, this is the data that we have, which is a dictionary of a dictionary of a set. Okay. So when you call add term, like here, you add it to the uh, uh, title here, and then we break it on a word boundary and add it here. So this is what this looks like. This is uh, uh, this this code running here, put with this this output. And now you can see here is the field title, and here are the individual terms. And for each terms, you have something called a posting list. 
And this posting list is the set of documents that has this particular term and this particular field. So you can go from here to here very easily. So give me all of the uh, documents where title is indexing, the status is awesome. So title indexing, we have one. Status awesome is this one. So intersect both of those together and you get this. Oh, so, so you're, if I want to point something out here, it looks like you're not only doing keyword searches any, or even you're doing more than just like fuzzy keyword searches. You're also doing metadata, like the title and the status. That is the metadata of the document. You're... Correct. So you need That's to be powerful. able to, yeah. So you see here, this is, uh, this is, I'm self doing full text search on the title. Here I'm doing an a, a, a equal check on the status. So those are different fields. They don't, they don't go all into the same bucket. Okay. Uh, but the key here is that conceptually, this is all you need. Hmm. So the, in, in indexing terms here, you break apart the text and then you add it to the right relevant terms. And at search time, you just go over that and that's it. Everything else follow from there. Now, why does it matter? It matters because this is really trivially simple concept to do to the point where uh, you can give it to high school students learning to program mm -hmm. and they would be the best to successfully do that. I like simplicity. Yeah, I, I, and honestly, this is the way pretty much any uh, uh, indexing or query engine works across the board. You have breaking up to terms, you have uh, uh, find them and that's about it. Everything else is just, uh, you know, details. Uh, but now, compared to how you would typically use an index on a relational database, that is a completely different beast because there the data is stored usually as, uh, oh, I want to index the name field. Right. So I don't, break, I typically don't break it and I typically have a, a B tree of some kind that I walk through to find the relevant items, but conceptually it's very, very simple. Now, Raven is a database. We build, we have like tons of trees there. So we decided that in order to implement this, we need three different things. One of them is the ability to uh, look up based on a particular term very easily. And then we have to get the set of documents that actually match here. And so far, this is basically the code that just showed. Where we starting to have a, a fun with that, let's say, uh, the actual implementation that we use. So uh, we need to have a persistent data structure, one that we can save to the disk and update on an ongoing basis. And it needs to be uh, super efficient for updates and queries. So we used something, uh, an algorithm called HOPE, which stands for, a, a, I don't remember the, the term. It's something. Uh, HOPE, H-O-P-E? Yeah. And it's HOPE encoder. And uh, come on, now I, now I forgot. I'm using my it's... Google Foo skills to see if I can find <laughs> Yeah, uh, there's a two. They're too common of a. <laughs> yeah, so it's not a high. Oh, okay, found found it. It. Yeah. open code or I found the GitHub page for it. Yeah, a high speed uh, order preserving encoder. That's the, that's the. I really wish I knew how they got to those uh, acronyms, <laughs> because I tried coming up with clever stuff like that, and I couldn't. Oh, I, I but, like your idea of using different languages. I think that's that's yeah, very clever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so HOPE is a really interesting algorithm because it does something, it's a compression algorithm, but it's not a standard compression algorithm because what it gives you is a really interesting promise. It will compress the data, but the compressed data would sort in the same way as the uncompressed data. Now, it does that by building a dictionary of the common data, and it doesn't matter, but basically we get compression that we can sort on the compressed state. 
Now, what does it matter? One of the things that we have to deal with is really large data sets. Right. And uh, again, I'm using the Raspberry Pi here. Uh, this is the Raspberry Pi Zero and 512 megabyte. I have a data set of 100 gigabyte that I'm using. So comparatively, comparatively this is a lot, especially because it has a really crappy disk. Uh, so I have to be able to squeeze into a, a, a small amount of memory as possible a lot of data. Hope allow me to do that and be able to really uh, get high density of data. And But the interesting thing about it, what am I actually doing with those three? Because I'm using Hope to uh, encode the uh, the keys, which are the terms that I'm searching for, which is the text, like the indexing engine, the awesome that we talked about uh, previously in the slide. And But what? how does it help me? Uh, the next step is to use something called a posting list. And a posting list is a very fancy, uh, fancy term, but it's basically a list of document IDs. What are the list of document IDs that are matching for this query? Hmm. And here we run into a huge problem. Lucene is limited to 2 billion records. Why? Because internally it uses an inter T2 for uh, the data set. I see. Uh, we do not want that. We actually hit that a number of times, and that was a real pain wow. to walk through. Oh, you have to shard the database, and this is stupid. Uh, there is no reason to shard it to, me, to billion. Shard it multiple terabytes, sure, but two billion is reasonable size. Mm. Uh, so one of the criteria that we had, I want to be able to process data sets greater than two billion which means that I have to use longs, which means in turn that uh, my posting list is made out of longs and that can take a huge amount of data. Try to imagine if I have a posting list that is 8 kilobyte, eight, uh, 8 byte per item, then a million records would be 8 megabyte, right. which is insanely large. I don't want that. So we went again into... A searching for an efficient algorithm for that. And we came up with a work made by Daniel Amir, who is pretty much, uh, there is a, a well-known XKCD about uh, that guy whose the entire internet is a, a, a standing on his work. You know what I'm talking about? I, I know XKCD. I'm not sure if I know that. Uh I would I, I would find that there is a very famous like uh, here we go I found a, let's see if I can share that thing it's called a XKCD dependency and this is the one oh let me zoom in on that yeah so. <laughs> just some random person in Nebraska. I have seen this one. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I don't think that uh, Daniel Mir is from Nebraska, but uh, <laughs> in the, the sense of database and performance, his name keeps coming up and he's doing amazing work. So right. one of the things that he that he did was, okay, let's, uh, uh, he published an article called uh, Decoding Billions of uh, Integers Per Second. And I like that number. I like that performance. Yeah. And he's using something called a fast P4 algorithm, which is a way to compress integers. And I won't get into how it works because it literally took me three weeks of staring at the code to understand what's going on. And now I can say, oh, yeah, it's obvious. But it took me three weeks to do that and like was incredibly frustrating. Mm -hmm. I've been looking, just to give you some context, I've been looking at that particular paper for about five years. Wow. And I kept coming back to it because this is the appropriate solution and it just went over my head each other and that. Eventually, I managed to uh, figure it out and then I realized that he's doing a, a, a two interesting. First of all, the algorithm about uh, how to do it is one side. But he also made it fast 
by using SIMD instructions. So SIMD stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data, and it is a way for the uh, CPU to do a multiple operation in one clock cycle. Hmm. So let's say that you want to sum up a, an array. So you can go over the entire array, sum it one at a time. Yeah. Or you could uh, do something called loop unrolling and sum four items at a time. Or you can add, or you can tell the CPU instead of some one two three four some the first four some the next four etc using what is called seamed or vector instructions. Hmm. This is basically writing in assembly, and the reason you would want to go there. Is that the performance boost? The, the performance boost that you get is wow. Sure. If, but, you're, if you're doing four at once, that theoretically should be a fourfold increase. Yeah, it's typically higher. That's the crazy thing. Yeah, because uh, I can. So let, let me uh, see if I can expand that in a way that would make sense without going to without being too nerdy even for this podcast. <laughs> Yeah, so when the uh, CPU starts executing instructions, it has the instruction it needs to execute, it needs to get the data to execute, it needs to uh, uh, write it somewhere. Mm. Uh, so you're talking about uh, the number of cycles that it takes you to execute the operation, but there's also the number of concurrent instructions that you can run at the CPU level. Mm-hmm. So uh, you can, and uh, when you start working with SIM, you have to understand all of those things in order to get the best performance. So it is possible for a single thread running on a single core to run effectively parallel instructions. And you build it in such a way that is completely non-intuitive because of because you basically have to understand the internal structure of the of the CPU, which is different than what you see at assembly level. Mm-hmm. Which is basically, it's by the way, it's a tremendous amount of fun to figure it out. Uh, it just takes uh, way too too long to explain how it works, but uh, you can arrange things that things would be faster than using memcopy, for example. Interesting. We are getting really close yeah. to the metal when you start to talk. About yeah, it, literally. Uh, we actually, yeah, we actually hit the uh, memory bandwidth limits, <laughs> and uh, the, like the physical hardware cannot support uh, uh, support uh, what I'm doing. Which is really funny for me, because how can we be faster than MemCopy if MemCopy is presumably running as fast as uh, the hardware will allow? Well, uh, this algorithm, uh, FastP41, uh, or seen FastP41, I think it's the official name, uh, it's working on compressed data. So we actually are hitting the limits on the compressed data, uh, that's the physical limit, but because we are now able to process it so quickly at the CPU level, then we are able to uh, basically far exceed that. So try to imagine that you have a one megabyte pipe and you send a compressed file over that. Effectively, you're running at a 10, 20 megabyte pipes. And this is what we're able to, uh, uh, to achieve. And this is really interesting because I have to write that in C sharp. So re- remember, I- I'm talking about internal CPU structure and using assembly instructions, all of those sort of things. But I'm writing in C sharp code. Yeah. Now you you can use assembly from uh, C sharp. You can uh, write a C function, write it in assembly, and use Pinvoke from that. But I need something that I can invoke millions and billions of times a second, the cost of P-Invoke is way too high. Mm. So uh, I mentioned that I drooled over .NET release notes, right? Uh, So one of the things that happened in the past few years is that we start getting compiler intrisings. And those are special methods that you can use from C-sharp 
that the JIT would recognize as special and emit direct code for. So oh, does it run in if, process then? It's beyond that. It was, so let's say that you're writing some code that, and you wanted to use vector instructions. You can use, uh, there is a NuGet package system vectors, and you can start using, and there is a manage API to use that. So you can say, hey, I want to do a vector, I want to use a vector instructions to summon array. And you do that. Hmm. And then, and all of the code is managed code. But then the JIT is involved. And the JIT says, hey, that particular method call, it's not an actual method call. I'm not emitting a call here. I'm turning that into a single assembly instruction. I see. So we are able to write C-sharp code. We are able to actually write pretty good C-sharp code. And the uh, JIT will turn it into the optimal uh, uh, instruction that I want. Oh, nice. Which, yeah. So C-sharp is uh, certainly it, more maintainable than assembly code. Yeah. Because it's more readable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Except that uh, we now find ourselves uh, uh, bouncing between, okay, I write my uh, C-sharp uh, program or message of function, and then I go look at the machine code, and then I, uh, and then I play around with that. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it, it's really funny, and you start doing a lot of super nasty things to the code. Yeah, my problem is that uh, I got into technology, so I wouldn't have to talk to people. And uh, yeah, uh, and it's funny because uh, writing and coding and developing turns out to be an incredible social uh, experience. I. Uh, I, I count my, the start of my career to working on open source projects and getting in touch with really high quality people on open source mailing list. And, you know, proving my credentials, getting friends from that sort of things that I've been friends with them for decades at this point. Uh, it's really funny. The, from I don't want to talk to people to I love talking to you. I love talking to people.